The second thing that we have to talk about B12 deficiencies. And you may have heard me talk about this, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to really articulate it clearly and go through what we discovered. Uh, Hippocrates, over years, many years, decades, uh, collected blood samples on hundreds of people who had been on the Hippocrates Living Food Program. Not fashionable and off the deep end programs, but ones that were scientifically validated. Uh, with not a lot of fruit in it, a lot of greens, fresh foods, sprouts that are literally nutritious versus vegetables that were picked a week, two weeks, three weeks or earlier and you're eating thinking you're getting something from, um, even some supplementation in its whole food form. And we were not finding people who had been on uh, the Hippocrates living food diet through blood tests had B12 deficiencies. Uh, Dr. Gabriel Cousins uh, alerted me a little more than three years ago along with George Malcolmus, who runs Hallelujah's Out Acres, he's a reverend, uh, that they were finding that not through blood tests, but through urine tests, that there were high B12 deficiencies among the general population and even vegans and even living fooders. So that sparked an interest. That, that information was given to me a little bit before we had our first international gathering of living food leaders. And that's where eight countries uh, represented by the leaders of living food came together and we're trying to create uh, international standards where we speak with one clear voice so that the populace is not confused and uh, doing fun things rather than right things. And in the first meeting we had, it was a major, major topic of discussion. And what was really stunning to me is that the harmonious agreement within a matter of 30 minutes that we need to start to tell people to take bacterial forms of B12 supplementation was really nice and good to see that we, we as a group grew to that level of maturity. So then I went on my own uh, search to see why this was. Fortunately, Anna Maria nor I, because we've been doing this for three decades, three and a half decades, had B12 deficiencies, but we found out we were the lucky ones because we then introduced at Hippocrates a test called a specter cell test. A specter cell test is the very first test I've ever been able to feel comfortable with as a nutritional scientist, because all other blood tests for nutrition literally took blood out and saw what actually was floating around in the bloodstream in the form of, quote, nutrients, versus what was ingested and absorbed by the blood cells. The specter cell test, literally we take the blood, ship it off to a laboratory, and they open up the leukocyte, the white blood cell, and see what nutrients have been absorbed by the human body. Hold your horses. We're finding about 65% of the general populace, including living food vegans, etc., have B12 deficiencies. Now, Gabriel's cousin's uh, attitude on this, along with uh, some input from George Malcolmus, if you were born to a living food couple as a baby, it would probably take us six years for us to acquire a significant B12 deficiency. But as you notice, we would acquire one too. I went off and I went to university medical school libraries and I spent numbers of hours there. Finally, I led myself to start to look at the anatomical structure of the human body, understanding that B12 is naturally a bacteria that you find in soil, organic soil obviously, not pesticide ridden soil, because bacteria are subject to death with pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, and cooking. Put that in the back of the head. So what we basically came to in my mind is that I better start to look at the large intestine because that's where the B12 resides and multiplies in theory. And when I went back about 300 years ago to about 1700, and then chronologically moved forward, looking at either sketchings, drawings, or then in the 20th century, photographs of the large intestine, it became apparent to me that the anatomical structure, the shape of the large intestine, the colon, had significantly changed over that 300-year period. Now, I'll try to describe it on the internet. It's a little difficult. I wish I, I, wish I had a sketch in front of me that all of you could see. You will be able to see this in the upcoming early summer Hippocrates magazine. Uh, we're going to specifically put that along with a lot of other information on nutrients and supplements and how important they are. What we show is that the 
colon 300 years, and assumably we didn't look before that, before that, at the ascending colon, the part that goes down on the left side, right below the ileocecal valve, that's where the large, uh, the small intestine, which is all wiggled up in the middle of the uh, colon inside of the abdomen, basically poured out the digested food. When it went down, it went in at the bottom of the ascending colon to something look, that looked like an empty uh, front of a boot. So it protruded inward, looked like the front of a boot, and the way I can articulate that so you'll understand it is that that predigested organic matter, remember this is at times where we had nothing but organic food, a plant-based diet was, was in great part what most people ate always, and this digested food with, with all of the bacteria, all of the B12 bacteria in it went down there and literally cultured itself. Another picture you may have, it's like a fine organic soil and then the B12 actually created itself and recreated itself in that little pocket. With that said, by the early part, I really started to see it in 1850, but by the early part of the 20th century, and certainly by uh, the middle part of the 20th century, this had dynamically and dramatically changed. So now, where the ascending colon was dropping in the digestive food, you didn't have the front of a boot anymore, it just came straight down and straight up again. And what was it replacing, or what was in that area where the front of the boot, that little pocket, the farm park that I talked about was, was is a little shriveled up appendix. And that was what was there. The appendix was in part, part of that anatomical structure at one point. And the appendix, and I don't want to get off track, is literally part of the lymphatic system, the major filter system of the body. It has a secondary uh, work, and that secondary work is to uh, excrete a mucus lagenous type of substance, a lubrication, so that when the peristaltic action of the large intestine, that vibration that makes poop and everything come out of you, literally it lubricated and helped that. But at this point, it's in great part in none of our bodies practically lubricating well, and it's not filtering well, and we Today, sadly, here in the medical sciences, that uh, they're teaching the medical students that we don't need an appendix. A little dumb, but bottom line is we needed it, we just somehow disrupted it. So today we have a problem because we don't have a perpetual B12, which is cultured within the, the own, your own body, the, the large intestine. 